In 1934, the 17th Congress of the All-Union Communist Party, the so-called Congress of Victors, introduced the second five-year plan. Just like in 1914, the parties of bellicose imperialism, the parties of war and revenge are appearing in the foreground. It is very clear that we're facing a new war. The last duty of the 17th Congress was to elect the Central Committee, which made policy decisions between sessions of Congress. The voters crossed out names they opposed and left the names they voted for unmarked. During the election, Stalin received a significant number of negative votes, over a hundred, although the precise number is unknown, whereas only three delegates crossed out the name of the popular Leningrad party boss, Sergei Kirov. The results were subsequently covered up on Stalin's orders by Lazar Kavanovich and it was officially reported that Stalin also only received three negative votes. During the event, a group of veteran party members approached Kirov with the suggestion that he replace Stalin as the party leader. Kirov quickly declined the offer and reported the conversation to Stalin. The 17th Congress yielded a new set of party rules more in keeping with Stalin's needs, a party hierarchy more in accordance with his desires, and a new party control commission that he securely controlled. Of the 130 Nine full members elected at the 17th Party Congress, 98 would be wiped out in the purge. 294 days later, on December 1, 1934, Leonid Nikolayev entered the Smolny building. Seeing Sergei Kirov in the corridor of the third floor, he drew his revolver and shot him in the back of the neck. Then, he tried to commit suicide by shooting himself, but missed, losing consciousness. He was in a state of shock and was taken to psychiatric hospital too, where he was then arrested. According to the memoirs of Politburo member Anastas Mikoyan, Stalin, although the investigation had not yet begun, confidently accused the Zinoviev opposition of the assassination, scolding Yagoda, who had reported that he was going to look for a conspiracy among the hidden white guards and emigrants. Ten days after Kirov's assassination, the regional department of the NKVD prepared a list of more than 11,000 Leningraders who did not inspire political confidence. The arrests began. This massive replenishment to the Gulag was called the Kirov Stream. Zinoviev and Kamenev, the so-called right opposition, and their closest associates were once again expelled from the party and arrested in December 1934. They were tried in January 1935 and forced to admit moral complicity in Kirov's assassination. Zinoviev was sentenced to 10 years in prison and his supporters to various prison terms. In prison, he wrote to Stalin. I tell you, Comrade Stalin, honestly, that from the time of my return from Kristine by order of the Central Committee, I have not taken a single step, spoken a single word, written a single line, or had a single thought which I need conceal from the party, the Central Committee, and you personally. I have had only one thought, how to earn the trust of the Central Committee, and you personally, how to achieve my aim of being employed by you in the work there is to be done. I swear by all the Bolshevik holds sacred, I swear by Lenin in his memory. I implore you to believe my word of honor. In February 1936, shortly before the purge started in earnest, Nikolai Bukharin was sent to Paris by Stalin to negotiate the purchase of the Marx and Engels archives held by the German Social Democratic Party, or SPD, before its dissolution by Hitler. He was joined by his wife, Anna. The possibility of exile or escape was there, but he decided against it, saying that he could not live outside the Soviet Union. In Paris, Far from the watchful eye of Stalin and the party, Bukharin spoke of the mass annihilation of completely defenseless men with women and children. Under forced collectivization and liquidation of kulaks as a class that dehumanized the party members with a profound psychological change in those communists who took part in the campaign. Instead of going mad, they accepted terror as a normal administrative method and regarded obedience to all orders from above as a supreme virtue. They are no longer human beings. They have truly become the cogs in a terrible machine. The rearguard uprisings against the Republican regime during the Spanish Civil War, some say influenced how Stalin launched the upcoming national operations more directly than in the case of the Operation 447. Stalin was convinced that hostile powers such as Germany, Poland, and Japan would organize uprisings inside the country, resorting to anyone who'd had some sort of connection with foreign countries in order to form a fifth column of diversionists and wreckers. Soviet propaganda transferred these fears and assumptions to the people. Enemies, spies, 
Conspirators, saboteurs, and wreckers were seen everywhere, weakening the country from within. In August 1936, after months of rehearsals in secret police prisons, Zinoviev, Kamenev, and 14 others, mostly old Bolsheviks, were put on trial again. Zinoviev and Kamenev demanded, as a condition for confessing, a direct guarantee from the Politburo that their lives and that of their families and followers would be spared. This offer was accepted, but when they were taken to the alleged Politburo meeting, only Stalin, Voroshidov, and Yezhov were present. Stalin claimed that they were the commission authorized by the Politburo and gave assurances that death sentences would not be carried out. That goes without saying, he said. During the trial, Gregory Zinoviev confessed to being involved in the assassination of Sergei Kirov. I would like to repeat that I am fully and utterly guilty. I am guilty of having been the organizer, second only to Trotsky of that bloc whose chosen task was the killing of Stalin. I was the principal organizer of Kirov's assassination. The party saw where we were going and warned us. Stalin warned us scores of times, but we did not heed these warnings. We entered into an alliance with Trotsky. We took the place of the terrorism of the socialist revolutionaries. My defective Bolshevism became transformed into anti-Bolshevism, and through Trotskyism I arrived at fascism. Lev Kamenev added. I, Kamenev, together with Zinoviev and Trotsky, organized and guided this conspiracy. My motives? I had become convinced that the party's Stalin's policy was successful and victorious. We, the opposition, had banked on a split in the party, but this hope proved groundless. We could no longer count on any serious domestic difficulties to allow us to overthrow Stalin's leadership. We were actuated by boundless hatred and by lust of power. Kamenev's final words in the trial concerned the plight of his children. I should like to say a few words to my children. I have two children. One is an army pilot, the other a young pioneer. Whatever my sentence may be, I consider it just. Together with the people, follow where Stalin leads. They were both executed about five days after the trial. Western journalists, the type Lenin had called useful idiots, covered the trials and reported them as open and fair. What they did not know then, but what is now known, were the methods used to extract the confessions on which the guilty verdicts depended. They included torture by repeated beatings, simulated drownings, forcing prisoners to remain standing, depriving them of sleep for several days, and threatening to arrest and execute their families. On September 25, 1936, Stalin, while relaxing in Sochi with Andrei Zhashdanov, sent a telegram to the members of the Politburo. We consider it absolutely necessary and urgent to appoint Comrade Yezhov to the post of Commissar for Internal Affairs. Yagoda was clearly not up to the task of exposing the Trotskyist Zinoviev bloc. The OGPU was four years late in this matter. This purge had two sides, a public side and a hidden side. The public side was the ongoing show trials where Zinoviev and other party bosses confessed to terrorism and other imaginary crimes. The hidden side consisted of about 12 top secret NKVD operational orders not designed for circulation or discussion. On July 2nd, 1937, the Politburo issued a strictly secret resolution ordering regional party authorities to present, within five days, estimates of the number to be arrested Local officials responded by presenting precise estimates of the numbers of kulaks and criminals in their region to be shot or exiled, as troikas were established in regions and territories across the USSR. The largest number of candidates for execution and deportation was presented by the first secretary of the Moscow Regional Committee, Nikita Khrushchev. As of July 10th, there were 41,305 criminal and kulak elements on Khrushchev's lists. 8,500 were proposed to be shot and 32,805 to be evicted. Ten days before the 447 order was issued, Stalin scribbled a short note during the Politburo meeting of July 20th, 1937. All Germans working on our military, semi-military and chemical factories are all to be arrested. On July 30, 1937, arrests began on Order 447, the so-called Kulak Operation. On August 11, the Polish Operation 485 went out, then Order 486, dedicated to the wives and children of enemies of the people. By August 31st, about 150,000 people had already been arrested in the 447 Kulak Operation, and more than 30,000 of them were shot. 
In the Polish operation, the number of victims was also already in the thousands. The intensity of arrests and executions were increasing every week. By the end of August 1937, the Politburo was assailed with numerous requests for the initial quotas to be raised. The quotas were characteristic of the figure mania, which had spread over every sector of the economy, politics and social life in the 1930s. Whereas instructions laid out in Order 447 needed no special preamble or instructions, Order 485 regarding the Polish operation required a long explanation. The targets were indeed uncommon. The 30-page secret letter attached to the order explained in full detail how for the past 20 years an immense organization set up by Polish army headquarters the so-called Polish military organization, had infiltrated many crucial spheres in Soviet politics and the economy, starting with the Polish Communist Party and the Polish section of the Comintern, and up to defense industries or large collective farms in the Ukraine. Although the PMO was disbanded in 1921, Soviet authorities claimed that it continued to exist. Order number 485 did not fix any quotas of people to sentence in the first or second category, but indicated several categories of people to arrest. In the case of the Polish operation, these were all Polish ex-prisoners of war, all Polish refugees, all Polish political exiles, all ex-members of the Polish Socialist Party, all anti-Soviet and nationalistic elements where there existed a Polish community. All Soviet citizens having had some sort of contact with Polish diplomatic, consular, military, commercial, or economic representatives in the USSR. Local officials of the NKVD were encouraged to add specific groups, which they did. In Kharkov, for example, Leonid Reifman ordered the following additional categories of people to be arrested. All ex-agents of the NKVD Foreign Department having been in charge of Polish affairs. All informants of the NKVD specialized in Polish affairs. All clerical elements having or have had some kind of connection with Poland. All Soviet citizens having family or other suspect ties in Poland. Turning to the Red Army, Stalin struck without warning. On May Day, Mikhail Tukhachevsky found his way to his usual parade spot atop Lenin's tomb, blocked by security guards. And ten days later, without explanation, he was demoted to the command of the Volga military district. Stalin assured Tukhachevsky that he would soon be back in Moscow. And he was arrested on arrival and thrown into the dreaded Lubyanka prison with Marshal Yakir and six other generals. It took just two days for Tukhachevsky to sign a confession to being a Nazi spy. When his interrogation record was uncovered decades later, after the fall of communism, the pages were splattered with blood. On June 11, 1937, the Soviet Supreme Court convened a special military tribunal to try Tukhachevsky and eight other generals for treason. The trial was dubbed the case of Trotskyist anti-Soviet military organization. Upon hearing the accusations, Tukhachevsky was heard to say, I feel I'm dreaming. Within an hour of the guilty verdict, Tukhachevsky was summoned from his cell by NKVD Captain Vasily Bloki. As Yezhov watched, the former marshal was shot once in the back of the head. Immediately afterward, Yezhov was summoned by Stalin. Stalin asked, What were Tukhachevsky's last words? Yezhov responded, the snake said he was dedicated to the motherland and comrade Stalin. He asked for clemency, but it was obvious that he was not being straight. He hadn't laid down his arms. At an emergency meeting of Red Army generals to explain the arrests, Stalin charged. These men are puppets in the hand of the German army. The German army wants the government here to be overthrown, and they tried to accomplish that but didn't succeed. The German army wanted the army to be disrupted so that it would not be ready to defend the country. From his cell, Marshal Yakir wrote Stalin a pitiful plea for mercy. My entire conscious life has been spent working selflessly and honestly, in full view of the party and its leaders, he professed. Every word I say is honest, and I shall die with words of love for you, the party, and the country with boundless faith in the victory of communism. Stalin wrote on the appeal. Swine and prostitute. Borisidov chimed in. A perfectly precise definition. Stalin's political toadies followed suit. The entire agreement with Stalin. Pen Molotov. Lazar Kaganovich, Yakir's erstwhile best friend, went furthest of all. 
for a bastard, scum, and whore, there is only one punishment, he said. The death penalty. The Soviet Union's remaining marshal, Vasily Blyuka, was beaten to death after refusing to confess. His widow said he looked like a tank had run over him. In February 1937, the arrest of Nikolai Bukharin finally came. In a final third show trial, meant to be the culmination of all previous trials, it is alleged Bukharin responded by going on hunger strike. Stalin criticized him. How dare you give us an ultimatum? Who are you to challenge the Central Committee? He was tried in the trial of the 21 on March 2, 1938, along with Yenrich Yagoda and 19 other defendants alleged to belong to the so-called Bloc of Rightists and Trotskyites. Stalin observed the trial from a hidden chamber in the courtroom. While in prison awaiting his fate, Nikolai Bukharin wrote 34 desperate letters to Stalin. Not one was answered. In one he promises that, if released, he would wage a mortal war against Trotsky. In another letter, he asks of Stalin, Koba, why do you need me to die? In his last letter to Stalin, Bukharin writes pathetically, I have learned to cherish and love you wisely. He begs Stalin to allow him to die by poison, not by a bullet. Let me have a cup of morphine. Not only did Stalin ignore this request, but Bukharin was forced to sit and watch as others were shot before him. Bukharin was executed and buried in a mass grave on March 15, 1938, at the Kominaka shooting ground, along with Jenrich Yagoda. On December 8, 1938, a short notice in the back pages of the Moscow newspapers announced that Yezhov had, at his own request, been released from his duties as Commissar of the NKVD. Yezhov was promoted to the post of Commissar for Water Transport, clearly an ill omen. Well acquainted with typical Stalinist bureaucratic precursors to eventual dismissal and arrest, he plunged headlong into alcoholism and despair. He lived a depraved and ghost-like existence, though still surrounded by his former colleagues and friends, all refused to talk to him. Yezhov was arrested on April 10, 1939. Yezhov was shot in the basement of a small NKVD station on February 4, 1940. The basement had a sloping floor so that it could be hosed down after executions and had been built according to Yezhov's own specifications. His name never appeared in print again during Stalin's lifetime. The mass repressions ended in the same way they had started, by a secret resolution taken at the highest level by Stalin and his closest associates. Stalin's trial against me is built upon false confessions extorted by modern inquisitorial methods in the interest of the ruling clique. There are no crime in history more terrible in intention and execution than the Moscow trials of Zinoviev Kamenev and of Petakov Radek. His trials developed not from communism, not from socialism, but from Stalinism, that is from the irresponsible despotism of the bureaucracy over the people.